Hello, everyone, and welcome to the April and Lecture Series. Um, my name is Yan Xu. I am the host and discussant for today's session. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science in the Cognitive Science Program at the University of Toronto. Um, Ibrahim Al Vivo Linguist Online is an initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Gemma Boleta. Uh, Dr. Boleta is an ICREA research professor in the, in the Department of Translation and Language Sciences of the Universitat Pompeu Fabla, Spain. In her research, Dr. Boleta uses quantitative and computational methods to investigate how people convey meaning through language. And her work draws on computational models, including distributional semantics and neural networks to induce rich and flexible linguistic representations. And today, uh, Gemma is going to talk to us about when do languages use the same word for different meanings, the Goldilocks principle in the lexicon. So Gemma, thank you very much for joining us today and participating in this talk series. Before I let you take it away, let me just remind everyone that there will be a Q&A session at the end of the talk. And so to raise a question, you may do so through the chat function. Um, I'll keep monitoring the chat messages as they emerge and uh, post your questions to, to Gemma on behalf of you. So Gemma, we look forward to your talk and uh, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the invitation to this series and, and, and thank you, Jan, uh, for the nice introduction. So let me let me share my screen. And um, so before I dive into the main topic of, of this talk, um, I'd like to start with a little a bonus material because we just released a stable version of, uh, of a data set that I think uh, can be of interest to the audience of this talk. Um, this is joint work with Thomas Pochhagen, Eleonora Gualdoni, Andreas Medebach, Karina Zilbera, Matthijs Vestera, and Zinat Harris. And um, so we start with the question, how do people name objects? How, how do they choose a, a word when they have to name an object? And um, let me start with a little experiment. So if I ask you to please name the, the object in the red box with the first name that comes to mind, um, if you're speakers of English, uh, you will probably respond um, duck or bird or maybe animal, although that's that's unlikely. So what we did is to pose this same question to, to a ton of people. And uh, we gathered 25,000 images with 36, 36 names per image in English. Uh, we'd like to <laughs> expand to other languages for the moment it's only English. And the, um, the subjects in our data collection um, to this image that you just saw, they responded duck, 33, like 33 of them responded duck, and only three said bird. Whereas for this other image that also contains a duck, uh, most of the participants um, produced bird and only a few produced duck. And uh, this is just a small teaser of the kind of data that we have in many names. And uh, of, of these 25,000 images, um, they are from different domains, uh, namely animal plants, buildings, clothing, food, home, like objects that appear in the home, people, and, and vehicles. And we're starting to analyze this data, and it's, uh, it's, it's really nice. And we hope that uh, you will also go ahead and do, do fun stuff with it. So now, back to the main topic. Um, the, uh, this part of the talk is joint work with Thomas Bochhagen, also from the Universitat de Fabra. And our, our work concerns lexical ambiguity, right? Because we're asking when languages put more than one meaning in the same word. Uh, so we're talking about lexical ambiguity, but we do so from a particular perspective that makes um, using a different term instead of ambiguity useful. And that term is colexification. Probably for most of you, it's the first time that you hear such, such a term. So let me introduce it just with one example. If you have two meanings that are here graphically depicted on the slide, um, so 
you can do like English and assign each of the meanings in, in to one word. So here we have toe and here we have uh, finger. Or you can be like Catalan and uh, co-lexify them in the same word. That is, put the two meanings, package the two meanings into a single word, in this case, bit. And Catalan is my native language, by the way. Uh, so, so I know it well. Um, and so, yeah, so we say that different meanings co-lexify and note that this is a shift, just a shift in perspective from lexical ambiguity. So when we talk about lexical ambiguity, polysemy, homonymy, we start with a, with a given word and we check how many meanings it has, all right? And instead, when we talk about collexification, we start from the meanings and we check whether they, uh, they get assigned to the same, the same word. All right, so uh, it's a shift in, 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 in perspective, um, but it's the same phenomenon. All right, so turns out that Catalan is not alone in collexifying these two meanings. There's many other languages, Chamaral, Hafsa, Rotuman, and many others, more than 100 in our database, that um, have the same collexification. So it's as if languages like collexifying these two meanings in a sense. Now contrast this with the situation for the word lime uh, in English that collexify two meanings uh, that we can paraphrase as a certain type of citrus fruit and a certain type of alkaline substance. I'm not aware of any other language that collexifies these two meanings. And so languages seem to like collexifying uh, the first and, and not like collexifying the second pair of meanings. And so the question is, why? What, what drives these, these patterns? And in previous work by our host, uh, Yang Shu and colleagues, um, Shu, Shu and colleagues posit that this, um, this trend is actually explained by looking at uh, semantic relatedness. So essentially, languages like to collectify uh, meanings that are related, okay? So if you're semantic, uh, semantically unrelated, like the two meanings of, of line, your likelihood to collectify will be fairly low. And the more related you are, the more likely you will be to collectify. That's, that's the idea. And the, um, these authors provide uh, some evidence for this, for this uh, explanation, and they attribute it to the drive for languages to be simple. So the, 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 the drive for simplicity. And to, to get an idea of why collexifying related um, meanings helps, let's consider a situation in which in which there's a, a Catalan child who has already acquired uh, the knowledge that the word did is used for fingers. Now this child is faced with a new situation in which somebody is using did to refer to something in the food instead of the hand, right? Now this child can leverage the, the knowledge that it has about uh, the meaning of did to first identify the right reference, so understand that it's the extremity of the, of the food that is being referred to. And also, little by little, um, actually expand the meaning of this word by, make, by taking a relatively small step, right? So, so it helps, uh, uh, collectifying related meanings helps in making languages easier to learn in this sense. Note that the child can also um, recycle a lot of the semantic material that it already has, uh, for instance, to extend uh, aspects of meaning, such as you know, uh, um, having nails, um, being at the, at the extremity of a limb, these kind of things uh, can be recycled and, and just uh, uh, expanded, as I was saying, with a, with a really small step, relatively small step. And the, um, the same kind of argument can be made as for uh, not only for language acquisition, but also for language use. Um, 
And contrast this situation with an English child now that has learned that the word lime refers to a kind of fruit, right? Now, if this child hears lime being applied to some kind of geological substance, you know, she doesn't have the same kind of, you know, scaffold to build upon to extend the meaning of lime. And of course, uh, she will eventually learn it, but it will be by road memorization and there's no, no help here uh, going on, right? So um, this work and also much previous work shows that languages strive for simplicity in the sense that they need to be simple enough, easy enough that we can learn them and, and use them with our limited cognitive uh, systems. All right, so our work starts with a bit of a thought experiment in which we say, okay, fair enough, that, that makes sense, but surely there must be some kind of limit to this tendency, right? Because, you know, when meanings are very, very, very related, they will tend to occur in the same kind of uh, referential envir environments, in the same kind of contexts, and then um, at some point, this will cause communicative issues. And let me give an example of what we mean. Consider the meanings left and right here shown on the, on the slide. Now, when we say go left in a given situation, usually there's some kind of contextually relevant alternative which would imply going right, right? And uh, so if we were to collectify these two meanings, say in a new word, say the word DAX, and we, we say go DAX in this situation, that is not very informative as to what, what the speaker wants us to do, right? And indeed, um, languages not only need to be simple um, or simple enough, but they also need to be informative in the sense of supporting accurate information transfer uh, between between speakers. And um, indeed, this previous work that I was mentioning has um, has shown that language that there is this trade-off between simplicity and informativeness that la that languages uh, face. And this work has also argued that languages in many domains, achieve a near optimal balance between the two pressures. And, and we can see signatures of this kind of tug of war between, with, between these two pressures in, in, actual, in, in, in how languages are shaped. Now, what we will do is to examine this trade-off between these two forces in the domain of the lexicon, which has received comparatively little attention. All right, you may be thinking, wait a second. So you just told me that collexifying left and right is a bad idea because um, left and right can be confusable in a given context, right? How about collexifying finger and toe? Doesn't that also hamper informativeness? Well, yes, it does. So whenever we introduce um, some ambiguity in the lexicon, we're automatically introducing confusability. There will be situations in which we want to distinguish between fingers and toes, and Catalan only provides us, provides us with one word for both, which is teeth. Now, fortunately, languages do not only have a lexicon, they also have a grammar, and that's what we use with we Catalan speakers when we want to distinguish these two meanings. We use expressions, did dal pel, that's finger of the foot, and did de la main, finger of the hand, all right? So the issue here is not whether a given language can or cannot express um, a, a given semantic distinction. The question is whether it cares enough about it to actually encode it in the lexicon. And the hypothesis is that it will care more in general about left and right than it does, um, than it cares about finger and so on, all right? Okay, so going back to the to to the to our contribution, our hypothesis is that informativeness will counteract simplicity, 
And so at some point, the relationship between semantic relatedness and collapsification likelihood will break down, okay? And more concretely, more concretely, what we hypothesize is that languages follow what we call a Goldilocks principle in, in collapsification. And the Goldilocks principle can be um, depicted uh, as in the slide. So what we are saying is that um, meanings collapsify when they're neither unrelated nor too related, but just right. And this is a hom homage to the fairy tale uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, in which the main character, Goldilocks, also wants things that are neither too related nor too, uh, sorry, neither too little nor too much, but just right. And what does just right mean in our context? Well, it means related enough that collexifying them helps with language acquisition and use, and at the same time, not so related as to become uh, too confusable and cause too much communication trouble. And it's a, a crucial ingredient of our hypothesis is that we take too related to mean too confusable. That is, um, it has to do with using language in context and with the um, communicative issues that uh, ambiguity causes. All right, and I will come back to this aspect um, later in the talk. Okay, so we have a hypothesis. Now let's test it. Uh, what we are doing is checking the relationship between meaning relatedness and collexification. And for that, we need uh, data. And in particular, we need proxies for each of these two phenomena. For collexification, we are really um, grateful to be able to use a great resource, uh, namely the CLICS database of cross-linguistic collexifications that's freely available. And this database contains data for over 3,000 language varieties and uh, almost 3,000 meanings. And on the slide, uh, there's a screenshot of the, of the interface. And as you can see, what Clicks provides us with is, on the one hand, an inventory of meanings that we just use as is. And on the other, the, the words that are associated with these meanings in different language varieties. So it, it is uh, very straightforward to retrieve the data that we need from this database and, and get um, data points such as the one showed in, in the slide here, in which we have a, a given meaning pair here um, and whether it collectifies or not in, in, in each of the, of the languages. So here we have that toe and finger collectify in Catalan, do not collectify in English, and then uh, so when citrus fruit do not collectify in Hausa, for instance. And we have a ton, a ton, a ton of data points to, to, to play around with. Okay, we got our proxies for classification. Now to relatedness, we use um, two measures that are very standardly used in computational linguistics and cognitive science. The first one is distributional similarity. And distributional similarity, uh, measures how similar the context of use, the distributions, the linguistic distributions of uh, different expressions. So for instance, if you check a, a large corpus, you will find some context um, for finger and toe that are quite similar. So we can talk about broken fingers and we can also talk about broken toes. And you will also find contexts that are different, right? There's a song that's called One Little Finger and not One Little Toe. And we can say from head to toe, but not really from head to finger. Uh, what distribution similarity does is it summarizes all this data into a measure that tells us how similar two expressions are in, in, in distributional terms, that is in, in context of use. And then the idea here is that the more similar the context of two uh, words, the higher their semantic relatedness. And just to ground this notion in, in, in specific examples, the distributional resource that we use tells us that the English words toe and finger have a distributional similarity of 0 0.47. And the words toe in, and chest are still related, but not as much. They, are, um, they have a distributional similarity of 0 0.31. 
whereas the words tow and kill have a very, very low distribution of similarity and, 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 and extrapolating, we say that they have a very low semantic relatedness, all right? Uh, this is all I'm going to say about, uh, about distributional approaches in this talk. But I wanted to flag that uh, this is just one of the many tools that distributional semantics offers for, for the study of language. And I think it has a lot of potential. And if you're interested, um, you can check the, the survey uh, that, I, that I cite here on the slide that appeared last year in the Annual Review of Linguistics. Okay, so here I need to stop again and say, uh, and reply to something that you're probably thinking. It's like, uh, excuse me, you were talking about um, meaning relatedness and now uh, you switched to words somehow. Uh, why is that? Well, this is because meanings are not observable. And so we need to use some kind of, uh, you know, uh, some means to get to meanings. Uh, to meaning to meaning relatedness, some other means. And the standard means also in previous research is to go via words. And so what you do is you essentially take relatedness between words and you extrapolate it to the relationship between meanings. So um, as you can see on the slide, um, if our distributional similarity estimate for the words to a finger in English, then we can just use it as is for these meanings. And the nice thing about this approach is that then this allows us to, to test any language, right? So we can test uh, the likelihood that these two meanings co will collect C5, for instance, in Catalan or in Hausa or in Romanian, etc. okay? Now, this is nice because it allows us to test hypotheses. Um, it comes with high cost, right? Because it comes with the cost of taking English as the universal uh, representation of semantics. And that's clearly very, very biased. Um, so why do people do it? Well, there's, there's, there's really no alternative. Uh, the English is the language for which we have the most resources. And we are doing a little better than previous work because we are using actually two estimates, not only English, but also uh, Dutch. Here you have the two words um, for the words for toe and finger in Dutch. And if we check our distributional resource, uh, it tells us that their distributional similarity is 0.43, uh, which, is, um, which is a bit different from the English estimate, right? So what, what we are doing is we're estimating uh, semantic relatedness using two views of the lexicon. What's a pity is that we end up uh, we, we ended up with two languages that are actually very close. Uh, I wish this was you know Korean or something else instead of Dutch. Um, but again, it's a matter of um, availability of resources and in particular availability of the second type of resource that we use in this research, which is associativity data. Um, associativity data are um, used in, in, in cognitive science chiefly. And these data come from human subjects, not from, from corpora. And the idea here is that you give some subject a cube, like toe, for instance, and you ask it to produce words that, that, that come to mind when, when reading toe. And for instance, a subject may produce foot, finger, and nail, and another subject may be something, something else. So when you have this data, uh, th these are so-called association norms, and to the best of our knowledge, the only large-scale association norms that are publicly available are for English and Dutch. And that's why we focus on these languages as meta-languages, because we analyze a, a lot, a lot of languages, but our, our view of the lexic of, of, of the sem of, of semantics comes, comes, comes from these two languages. All right. Now, uh, using this data, uh, what we do is what we say is that um, essentially, it's a bit more convoluted if you want, you can ask me the question period and I'll explain it better, but essentially it boils down to saying, okay, if two words, um, th the more shared associates um, two words have, the higher their relatedness. So that's, that's the idea. And um, again, to illustrate, uh, associativity gives us similar information for toe and finger and toe and kill. 
uh, as what we had with distribution semantics. They tell us that toe and, and finger are, are quite unrelated. Again, this is a measure that goes up to one, and toe and keel are not related at all. However, it gives us different information for toe and chest. So uh, according to distribution similarity, these two are quite related. And instead, according to associativity, um, they're like much less, much, much less related. So these two estimates of uh, relatedness give us slightly different views on what it means for two meanings to be related. And uh, sorry, uh, I forgot to say that here we, of course, use the same expediency. We are using words as surrogates for meanings. All right, um, we defined a third and final measure of semantic relatedness, which is a combination of of these two uh, of these two measures. For those of you who know about algebra, what we what we do is a principal component analysis and and choose the first first principal component of distribution similarity and associativity as our new measure of, uh, of relatedness. And if you don't know about principal components, you don't need to. Just uh, bear in mind that this is a combined measure. Uh, it's, it's a principal combination of the information in these, two, in these two other estimates, all right? Okay, so now we have our data. Let's, uh, let's start analyzing it. And how do we do it? We do it with statistical models. And uh, our statistical models, what they want to do is to predict whether a given, uh, a, a given meaning pair collexifies or not in a given language as a function of the relatedness of the two meanings. This is our main uh, predictor of interest, but also as a function of two other predictors that have been shown in previous work to be related to, to play a role, sorry, uh, in collexification. So the first is geography, because languages that are geographically near, like Spanish and Basque, even if they're not related in any other way, will share a lot of collexification uh, in virtue of language contact. And um, the other one is phylogeny, uh, because again, languages that are uh, phylogenetically related, like say Catalan and Romanian, in virtue, uh, that, that is that they have a common ancestor, namely Latin. Again, they will share many collexifications just because they both inherited them from the, from the mother uh, language. So we want to see whether relatedness has an effect over and above these two other factors that have been known to, to affect it, okay? And actually we built not just one statistical model, but three. Uh, namely one for each of the measures of semantic relatedness that we have designed. Um, just one more thing about the model. Uh, re remember that we are hypothesizing um, a curvilinear relationship between semantic relatedness and collectification likelihood. So not, not a linear relationship, that's not a straight line, but something weakly. And so we have to use a kind of model that allows for wiggles. And these are generalized additive models. The only thing that you need to know about these models for the purposes of this talk is that one, they allow, they allow for wiggles. So they allow us to test our hypothesis. And two, that they are very conservative. That means they will try to stay linear and will only uh, allow for a wiggle if the data really strongly um, asks for it, so to speak. All right. Okay, so let's see what we get. Uh, the first thing we ask is, okay, we have three different ways to estimate semantic relatedness, which is the measure that better uh, describes the data that we're interested in, namely collexification. So what's the best measure uh, among these three to account for collexification data? And it turns out that it is combination, uh, that the, 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 the combined measure, uh, which is not only the best of the three measures that we consider, but it's also quite good in absolute terms. So if, you, if we use this model that uses, the statistical model that uh, uses this combined measure to predict whether a given meaning pair uh, will collectify in a language or not, our model gets it right 84% of the time. 
uh, to compare, or to put it in, in perspective, a uh, random guessing, just making random codexification decisions, just by chance, would get it right 50% of the time. Okay, so we get a, a, a much better performance, 84%, which is also you know, reasonably close to 100. So we are happy with our model. Uh, we think that, and we think that it's a good enough model of codexification that we can use it to ask the question, how does semantic relatedness um, relate to codexification likelihood? And the effect that we expect as a reminder, is this one. So this is the relationship that we expect the model to find. And this is what we get, which is very similar, very close to what we were expecting, right? I'm going to, so this, this graph depicts the effect of semantic relatedness on collectification decisions of the model. I'm going to ask you to just ignore the, the axis, all right? And just, um, very intuitively um, understand that this axis, this, this axis here gives us the semantic relatedness. And so what, what, what it does is to increase the likelihood of collectification as, as, as it goes up, up to a certain point, an inflection point, after which it goes down again. Okay, so it makes collectification uh, go down again relatively to, to, to how it was. Um, you, may, you may notice that there's this gray area here in the upper part. This represents the uncertainty of the model. Um, the model is less certain here than here because there's fewer data points. And the data actually are compatible with a downward trend it's also compatible with a very much more radical downward trend than the, than the blue line, but it's also compatible with a very, very, very slight uh, downward trend, almost a plateau. Okay, so the, 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 the best guess of the model is, is the Goldilocks uh, dip, but it, uh, the data are also compatible with a, with a plateau. But what's very, very clear from, from the model is that there is a change in regime as we predicted in the upper parts of the semantic relatedness. Okay, so the, the linear trend gets uh, totally disrupted. Um, it, it may be um, informative to, to check this uh, effect of semantic relatedness by looking at, the, at a couple of predictions from the model. Because once we have the model, we can also use it to, you know, generate to hallucinate uh, collectification likelihood uh, for, for, for specific meaning pairs in a given language, but I'm going to, to gloss over that. So, okay, here we see that uh, there's, there's, there's uh, meaning pairs that are very uh, unrelated according to our estimate of semantic relatedness, like three and yes, and log and chop, and these are assigned really low um, collectification likelihood. We predict that languages will not like to collectify those. Instead, as, as we go as we go right on semantic relatedness, we also go up in collectification likelihood, and uh, and so this increases for pairs like moon, month, bright yellow, town, people, weak, small, and spider, warm, fire, path, road, uh, until our uh, favorite example, toe finger, and then at a certain point around here. Um, it, it reaches a, a tipping point. And then uh, the uh, for very highly related meanings, like North, South, Stallion Mayor, and Tuesday, Thursday, it goes down again, okay? So to sum up, the data supports the Goldilocks principle that we, that we predicted, but there's one missing piece. Um, remember that we said that uh, this area here that we hypothesized uh, where the meanings were too, too related, uh, what we mean by too related is too confusable, right? Because what we are positing is that there's this communicative pressure coming in uh, where we really want to distinguish uh, meanings that can be confusable in context. And, and that really counteracts 
the beneficial effect of co-lexifying meanings that are related, okay? So this is the explanation that we have, or, or rather the prediction that we have is that we find this, this drop because of this. And for now, all we have shown is that there is a drop for highly related meanings, but we haven't really provided any direct evidence that confusability is at stake. So in the second and final analysis, we test the role of confusability in a more direct way. So to do that, uh, again, we need data, right? And we need um, a way to operationalize the notion of too confusable. What does it mean? We, we need to define independently what it means for meanings to be too confusable, such that then we can check what happens with their, with their collectification rates, right? And this is not easy. Um, when I was talking about left and right, I, I talked about this notion of contextually relevant alternative, right? Uh, uh, left and right tend to be possibilities that appear in the same contexts, right? So that, that causes confusion. And the same can be said for the meaning pairs that we had in the upper right corner of the, of the graph. Um, like for instance, Tuesday and Thursday, these are clearly alternatives, right? Not only to each other, like Tuesday is an alternative to Thursday. So when, uh, when you say Tuesday, one of the things that you're implying is not Thursday, uh, but also to the rest of the, of the days of the week. So um, Tuesday also implies not Wednesday, not Monday, et cetera, right? So there's this clear notion of you know, alternation here uh, and of, of things that can be alternatives in context. But this notion is not easy to, again, to operationalize in an, in, in an objective fashion. So what we do is we focus on a narrower, notion of confusability, which is opposite meanings, because it's much easier to get data for uh, opposition than it is to get data for a more generic uh, notion of contextually relevant alternative. And um, that doesn't cover, for instance, Tuesday and Thursday, because they're not opposites. It does cover uh, left and right and north and south. But it's fine not to cover uh, everything. We don't need a, a complete coverage of uh, of confusability of a, of, or, or of relevant alternatives. We just need something that uh, we are confident is confusable. OK, so our hypothesis for this analysis is that we will identify in languages a resistance to complexifying opposite meanings. Uh, because, as we said, they are extremely confusable in context, such that losing the semantic distinction that opposites encodes is particularly harmful in communicative terms, as I explained um, earlier with the example of left and right. Um, and the way we, we go about testing this hypothesis is to take different semantic relations and compare their collectification rate. So we will uh, check opposition and compare it to other semantic rela relations, in particular part whole. So toe is, the, is a part of the foot. So the meanings toe and foot stand in a part whole relation. And subsumption, uh, calves or cattle. So the meaning calf, cattle subsumes the meaning calf. And these three relations we will compare against a, let's call it a control group or a, like a, the, a default collectification rate, uh, which is for meanings that essentially are uh, unrelated, that have no, no, no semantic relation. And we will, we will do the usual trick of um, taking words as surrogates for meanings, and we will query a freely available lexical database and for instance, if um, if we identify if we if we if we identify that left the words left and right are antonyms in this lexical database, then we will extrapolate these to their meanings and say that their meanings are opposites. All right. Um, so this is just the usual trick. And by the way, we do this only with English because the lexical database for Dutch was too small. Uh, and we didn't get any, any data, unfortunately. 
All right, so here are the results. We have the, the, the four groups that I just presented. Um, meaning pairs that are unrelated or opposites or related by part whole or subsumptions relationships. And on the y-axis, what we have is the mean collectification percentage. That means, for instance, uh, meaning pairs that are related by a part whole relationship are um, collectified on average around 3.7% um, of the time, okay? So this is what we are depicting. And we can see two things very, very clearly. The first is that relatedness fosters collectification. Why? Because the three lexical relations con uh, are much more conducive to collectification than uh, no relation, which is basically the, the average collectification for this, for this uh, group here is, is very, very close to zero. Okay, so this is in accordance with uh, not only previous work, but also our first analysis where we found that uh, relatedness fosters collectification. Okay, the second remarkable result is that confusability indeed, as we expected, hinders collectification. So, why can we say this? Well, because um, opposite meanings collectify much less than, than other types, uh, than, than meaning pairs that are related in, in other ways, okay? And so in our interpretation, what we are seeing here in these results is um, the, the, the result of a tag of war, of, of um, a tag of words? Well, of the tension between simplicity and informativeness, uh, simplicity pushes, you know, collectification uh, rates up, uh, and informativeness pushes pushes them down, and so we end up in this middle in this middle uh, point here. Okay, and um, this is what we were expecting to find. And if you're puzzled that we still find you know quite a bit of um, collectification with opposites after I've been, you know, convincing you that, you know, it's not a good idea to collectify opposites. So why, why do we find this? Well, they are related and some languages decide, quote unquote, to collectify them. For instance, in our database, there's over 40 languages that collectify land and borrow. And the, lang the languages that do this uh, then can use, um, the, the speakers of these languages can use either contextual cues or grammar if they want to distinguish between between these things, these these uh, these two meanings, all right. Okay, so now we can move to the conclusion. And what we have shown, so we, we started uh, with this question: When do languages use the same word for different meanings? And our answer, based on large-scale cross-linguistic collectification data, is that they do so when the meanings are related enough to foster. Um, cognitive economy, that is related enough that collectifying them helps with language acquisition and use, while at the same time, not being too confusable in actual language use, not causing too much communicative trouble. And so what we have done is to provide further evidence that there's for this trade-off between simplicity, simplicity and informativeness that languages have to navigate. And uh, we found a universal signature of this trade-off in the lexicon. And in particular, in how languages associate words with meanings and how they manage ambiguity. And this is far from trivial, given that different language communities have very different uh, communicative needs. And, and given the, the wild variety that we find in, in natural language lexica. And so in a nutshell, what we have done is to provide further insight into how languages support efficient communication. I want to finish by giving a heartfelt thanks to the developers of all the, the resources that we have used in this, in this research uh, for making them publicly available and to the European Research Council for funding this research. Thank you.
Great. Thank you, Gemma, for the uh, very interesting and uh, clear talk. Um, I guess we'll open up the floor and see if uh, the audience has any questions for you. I'm going to start up with a couple of questions from my own, and uh, hopefully people will take those leads too. Okay, so um, very interesting. I thought the work is very interesting. And uh, one question I had in mind is to what extent um, there might be confounding factors here or other factors here that might explain on um, collectification patterns. So for mm -hmm. instance, in some of, of, of my work, but also others work, we've suggested that you can consider informative as, as a way of, uh, you know, as a factor that is driven by communicative need. So the idea is that if there are certain reference or meanings that you need to refer to or talk about more often than others, mm -hmm. uh, then they should be uh, amenable to actually the opposite of collectification, where you want to split those meanings. Mm -hmm. So a good example would be mother and father, for instance, are very frequently talked about, and it seems that it will be highly you know, inefficient to collectify those meanings. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, paternal grandmother and maternal grandmother are probably mm -hmm. less often talked about, and hence you see those to be collectified, at least in the case of English. So I wonder, yeah, like in your work, have you considered um, other possible metrics of uh, informativeness that are not just ambiguity? Thanks. So what we, what we have considered, I haven't presented it today, but what we have considered is a, 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 a point of suggestion by, by a reviewer is a frequency, like, mm -hmm. again, lexical frequencies as yeah. a proxy for communicative need in the sense of frequency. And uh, we have we have uh, tested uh, the models, uh, including these these factors, and and the, the results don't change. We still we still find the same pattern. I, now I don't remember if the model gets better, a bit better. I assume it does. I don't remember, but I do I do know that that we still find the same effect. So um, certainly there's 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 more communicative need than than, mm -hmm. than what we have found, but at least with uh, with frequency. Uh, we still find the same the same pattern. I see. So by frequency, I don't know if there's others. If you can suggest yeah. other other proxies that we could use. Yeah. So by frequency, are you referring to sort of word usage frequencies in English or in, in individual yes. languages? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's again. Yeah. It's again uh, English. I don't. I don't remember if we also used Dutch. I think we used both. Yeah. Yeah. Both English and Dutch. Uh, we check the, their, their frequencies in a standard resource. And then what we do is you compute the difference. Uh, like, I think you did that in your paper, right? You compute the difference between the most frequent one and the least frequent one. And, and that's, your, um, that's your estimate of the difference in kind of community, uh, community need of the two meanings. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thanks. That's interesting. Um, we do have a question from the audience, so I'm going to uh, patch that through. This mm -hmm. was raised by Masha. Could you talk about how the distribution of sim similarity and the sociability estimates of data would be affected by cultural, social, discursive, and even linguistic contexts? All right. So, well, even linguistic context, distribution of similarity is based on linguistic context. So in the sense of like the words surrounding this, um, also other types of context, but um, um, in distributional semantic models, what people have shown is that we can, uh, th th that these models carry over biases that are, that are found in society. Uh, there's, uh, there's a science paper that shows that uh, in this kind of models, uh, you know, gender stereotypes, um, these kind of things, uh, they, they are present there. So if you ask, you know, whether women um, are, what's a computer programmer, you will get a man, and what's a housemaker, you will get a woman, right? Things like that. So you can, uh, indeed, uh, because, uh, because these, these models are induced directly from data of how people use language, you know, if the people who use language have certain biases, those will, you know, be reflected in the in the distribution of model. All right. Um, so certainly, this kind of um, effects are mirrored in the in the in the data in the 
distributional models. I assume the same holds for association norms, but I'm less familiar with, um, with associativity data than with distributional data, but I can see similar effects arising in, 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 um, you know, in, in what you associate words with, and I'm sure that you also find biases. Um, now, whether, I'm not exactly sure how this would affect the relationship with, so what the relationship is between these aspects and colitification likelihood. Um, I'm, I'm, right now, I don't know how to translate uh, these effects, uh, like what they would expect uh, regarding colitification. So I don't know if there's, I, I don't know if we can identify, I don't think that we can identify culture specific aspects of colitification. Mm -hmm with these kind of measures. I'm not very optimistic, but I don't know. I'm saying that on the top, from the top of my, of my head and maybe, yeah. maybe there's a way to do that. Have you tried multilingual embeddings beyond English and see if the, you know, either the result, results are similar or different? Sorry? Multilingual. multilingual. Yeah, multilingual embeddings or, or word embeddings from other languages outside English. Well, so we have a problem with that because um, some of the some of the word embeddings that are available are of a, uh, of a very low quality in, in our previous experience. Mm -hmm. So so it's it's iffy. Um, um, so for, for, for this research, we, we like we needed anyway both of them like uh, to have both associative and distributional semantics because uh, distributional similarity because the, the the best measure is the combined measure and then you need both. And we have we have uh, played around with uh, with different models uh, in, in other languages, and we get a mixed picture. But the problem is this: that we uh, the, the the quality of these models is not good enough. Also, if you check uh, that, I haven't I haven't shown. Let me see what I had. A, I had a lot of <laughs> sorry. I had a lot of spare slides. So one thing I haven't shown is that if you check. Uh, the, the estimates, not for the combined measure, but for distributional similarity alone and associativity alone, um, you get a, a picture that is not as nice. Um, what's nice is that the, 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 the best picture of, of the estimate, the, the one that most um, accords with our prediction is the one for the, for the best model. So we have an independent reason to choose it because it's the one that best accounts for qualification. So we are not doing anything wrong here by choosing that one. But what we see here is that if we check only distribution similarity, uh, you, do, you do get um, with a lot of uncertainty, but you do get this, this curve. And if we, if we check associativity, we get a change in regime, but we don't really get a, a, a dip, okay? So uh, here there's maybe something going on that I would like to explore a bit more. So what's the difference between these two measures that, that gives us these different patterns? But okay, in a nutshell, answering to your, to your question, so for sufficiently high quality models, we do get the same pattern. And then the question is whether we can like have some kind of, uh, maybe what we could do is to get some kind of, uh, do it for, for models that we have independent evidence um, that are good enough uh, as representations of meaning. That, that would be an option. Sorry, I think I, I, I went a bit off path. No, that's answer. great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so this is a question raised by Gustavo, which is also kind of my question too. Um, we were wondering whether or why do languages collectify differently in the first place? So for instance, the case of Lime that you mentioned in English, and Gustavo's specific question concerns indigenous languages in Brazil. So for instance, they use the word for father and uncle uh, mm -hmm. when they're brothers. So, and he asked, you know, how can we understand this phenomenon based on your explanation or your work? Yeah, so, okay. So, well, there, there's two issues here, right? One is the issue of line. So you do find quirky collectifications, like things like Lime, where you, you wonder why on earth would you use the same word for these two meanings? And these tend to be historical accidents, all right? So as we know, there's very, very little homonymy in language, things like bank of a river as opposed to bank as a financial institution or, or Lime. 
And the vast majority of lexical ambiguity corresponds to polysyny, to some kind of systematic relationship between, between the meanings, which is a bit counterintuitive, right? Because it, again, if they're related, they can lead to confusion, yeah, like that. All right. So the first, the first one, like the example of flying, I just think it just it just took work. Um, so the, the other example, can, can you can you say again? Yeah, the other, the other example father is and in, in, yeah, father and uncle when they're brothers. Father and uncle in, in some indigenous languages are collectified when they are brothers. Yes. Okay. All right. So again, so in, in this case, this would be a case of, of uh, collectification due to semantic relatedness. So these meanings clearly are, are related. So putting them together, um, you know, you can put them together because they denote kind of similar kinds of entities in a way, right? Um, and then it's a question of, um, again, so you may argue, you know, when, 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 when you were talking about this notion of communicative need, right? You need to talk a lot about your father. The uncles, maybe not so much, but about your father, you tend to talk a lot, right? Uh, but this is then a, 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 a question of how languages decide to partition the world and how, how they decide to, and that's what I was saying at the end of the talk, right? I was saying like, um, sorry, it's like uh, here, that the, the, the fact that we find this universal signature of this trade-off is not a given because, you know, languages do really weird stuff. <laughs> and, 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 and the way that they partition, that they carve out reality in the lexicon varies a lot. And so some of it can be due to cultural factors. So it can be that in this in this uh, in this uh, language, in the culture of the speakers of this language, they there's something that makes this collectification more sensible than than in other uh, cultures, for instance. That can be. But I think that the bottom line is that there's both immense variation, wild variation, and universal um, trends. And then what you get out of this mix is a language that will be uh, unique. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, related to that, I guess I'm curious whether you've done some sort of comparative analysis on antonym pairs that are collectified versus antonym pairs that are not collectified in your data, right? Because you did say there are cases like borrow and land that are collectified. And I wonder if there are some systematic differences between these two groups of antonyms um, in a data set. So for instance, is it the case that borrow, borrow and land tend to you know, generally have lower frequencies of usage than, than other antonym pairs? So that's, that, that's a very nice observation. And no, we haven't, we haven't checked those data. Uh, I, will, I, I, I will have a look. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, because yeah, you probably I, I, don't have a lot of antonym pairs that are collectified, but it will be good to see if they are systematically different. Surprising, uh, it's surprising because <laughs> you know when, when you think about this data, you think like, no way, this is gonna be collectified, and then you find it. That's, that's yeah, what I was saying. Like languages do really weird stuff, no? And and for instance, like take English, uh, the word uh, the verb to rent refers to both you know the person who rents and the, uh, a house and the, and the person who lends this house, so to speak, right? So. It, it, it kind of doesn't make sense in a way, but 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 it, but it is no. And my hypothesis, yeah. without having checked the data, is that probably uh, verbal antonyms like land and borrow uh, are more likely to collectify than things like uh, left and right, mm -hmm. um, yeah. but or like adjectives in general. But yeah. I cannot say because I haven't checked. But it, it, it's it's a nice question to ask. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I also find the finding interesting and uh, relating to some work. I think it's by C. P. Antidosi and others who who suggested that, you know, lexical ambiguity can be resolved by context, right? It seems like context can solve all sorts of problems relating to ambiguity. But mm -hmm. it seems like you are suggesting that when they're extremely close, like in the case of antonomic cases, it, it, that they're hard to, to resolve even with, with the help of context. Um, so I'm gonna yeah. patch through, yeah, sorry. No, go, no, ahead. go ahead, go ahead, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna patch through others' questions. So Andreas has raised two questions for you. I'm gonna go one by one. So first question is, did you actually test if the curve from the GAN model, generated edited model, is a significantly better fit for the data 
and provides better prediction than a straight linear fit, i.e. differs from you know, the, the, the result that we obtain from, from our work? So that's mm -hmm. the first question. Mm -hmm. So as I was saying, uh, generative additive mo generalized additive models are conservative, so they will mm -hmm. not you know, they will not posit a, a curve if they can make do with right. a line. Um, so yes. However, I'm I'm like the, the statistician here. Well, he's also a linguist and many other things, so he's uh, he's great. But the person who who knows uh, about statistics much more than me is Thomas. So <laughs> about the specific, he has done all kinds of tests and this and that, and 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 I am fairly certain that the that the results are, are robust and that we do uh, have a much better fit with this with this kind of model. Yeah. But I cannot explain to you the technicalities because I, I get lost in them. So if you want to get in touch with uh, Thomas, by the way, I have a slide also about that. Um, so we have the code repository that's publicly available. You can get in touch with us and the, the manuscript is also available online. That's great. Yeah, I guess you could, you know, you can consider a model comparison where you control for complexity and goodness of fit. Oh yeah, that's, 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 that's that sort of thing. He, he's probably exactly. already done Yes, it. no, 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 yeah. sorry. Now, now I remember when, when you mentioned this, I, I remember, yes, we did that, yes. Yeah, <laughs> that great. I remember, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the second question from Andreas too is, do you somehow control for repeated measures in the model, i.e. languages and concept pairs both yield more than one data point? but probably not uniformly so. Yes. Um, so we have, we have a huge amount of data. We have something like 200,000 data points or something mm -hmm. like that. So we couldn't add a lot uh, of, of structure in the model. So we have one thing I didn't say is that we add a, a, a random intercept for each of the resources. So one is English, the other is, is Dutch. But we couldn't do much more than that. So we, and in particular, we don't include um, random interceptor slopes, if I remember correctly, like um, I hope that I'm not saying anything wrong statistically, again, ask Thomas, but uh, we couldn't include them for, for uh, meanings or meaning pairs or, or languages, languages, languages also not because we just have too much data. Uh, like the, the model would not converge. We tried and then and, and the model would not run. So yeah, that's a, mm -hmm. that's a limitation. We have to say that, that we have a ton, a ton, a ton of data, right? So uh, we have over 1,200 languages and over 1,400 meanings. So yeah, but yeah, it's still it a like sample. An incredible resource. So, yeah, yeah it, it's still a sample and we should do these things that Andreas is saying, but we just cannot because of compute. Um, issues. So this is a quick comment as opposed to a question from Andreas again. So uh, on the apparent low quality of word embeddings, maybe for low resource languages, but then there's exactly. things like fast text and BERT models train on massive data for quite a few languages. Uh, yes. I guess he was yes. saying it, these are, you know, available yeah, but, resources. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, no, I'm done. Say yeah. it again. No, I think he was just suggesting these as possible resources, additional resources beyond English. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, but what I was referring to when I said we tried is the fast text models precisely. Uh -huh. And if you if you go to the like the the, the the fast text paper, they only test the quality of about ten models, something like that. And then we have the German and French, um, etc., are are fine. But then they test Hindi, and Hindi is not a low resource language, right? It's I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty okay, and 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 Hindi mm -hmm. uh, in the standard test that, that you use to, to to test the quality of these models performs really low. So where French and German would be at um, uh, 70, 80 percent, or between 65, 75, something like that percent of performance in a standard benchmark, Hindi would be 30 something, okay. And then when you have this low quality, you cannot really use it, right, for anything. And the problem that we have is that we cannot predict beforehand. Of the other, uh, FastText has 157 models, uh, covers 157 languages. But of these languages, we don't know which ones are good or bad, right? And what we cannot say is to say, OK, we're going to use them. And the ones that give us the right prediction, we say these are good models. OK, so we need some kind of principle, 
principled way to choose between models. So I guess maybe what we could do is to use the models, the, the nine models that are that perform well according to the fast text article, and then use those. That uh, that would be that that would be uh, it. But we cannot just widely use any 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 model in fast text. I mean, they did it, they did a great job, but you know they just did this thing, and then uh, you know uh, we don't know how how good these models are. Great. So we have a question from Carlos. Have you ever considered to extend the Goldilocks principle to another grammatical module? Uh, he was thinking on the configuration of sound systems. Oh, wow. I'd like to hear more about this uh, suggestion. I'd like to hear more as well. I think probably is considering for sounds that, or word forms which have very similar sounds. Um, versus those that are you know sounding similar but not not quite the same or something like that. But Carlos, if you want, would like to elaborate your question, you're welcome to do so. But let's see if uh, Gemma has something to say along what you what you asked about. Yeah, if you can if you can elaborate uh, uh, about uh, along which lines you're thinking on in, uh, what the analogy is there that you that you think exists, I would be very happy to to hear about that. Um, I guess what it means maybe is that, I think this has been, I mean, I, I have no idea about phonology, but from what I remember, yeah, you kind of, you retain the, the, the sound distinctions that are kind of robust enough, right? And then you lose the ones that are not, but this is not quite the Goldilocks principle, right? Because we need not too little, not too much, just right. So I don't know exactly how to translate it. So no, I haven't considered that. I'd be very happy to consider it. And uh, if you have uh, ideas, please, please uh, run them. Yeah. Run them Carlos down. asked, may he write in Spanish? Uh, sure. Sure. <laughs> oh, well, no, I don't have access to the, to the chat on YouTube. Um, do you speak Spanish, Jan? All oh, right. I don't. I don't. I would like to, but I don't. <laughs> I guess I can try to. I can try to copy and paste the uh, the chat in you know in, into the in a Zoom. Uh, if uh, let me see if like I have. Well. Let me see if I can. Um, yeah. If you go to this the... link, I think you can look at the yeah, chat the messages. Link. Yeah. But I'll let you know once Carlos uh, has written down the Spanish version of his question. Okay, oh, actually, you. actually, he just did. If you refresh that page, you should be able to see. Yes. It. So he says, "I'm thinking that the lexification patterns can be compared to the configuration of allophonic um, alternations, where what we are doing is to um, how do you say aquí para." Um, compare, or the, the, the analogy here would be uh, phonemes instead of concepts, okay? So I don't, um, frankly, I, I have no idea. I will, I will think about it uh, a bit more, but off the top of my head, I cannot, I cannot think of, uh, of the analogy. Great. Um, I, I have a sidetrack question. I'm interested in the naming data set that you introduce in your bonus <laughs> slides. And, and I wonder how that naming data set, yeah, it's, it's, it looks fantastic. I wonder how it differs from, you know, the canonical resources in computer vision and machine learning like ImageNet. Is it related to that? Or in, and uh, if so, in what ways? Or how is it different from, you know, these standard resources? Yeah, so the difference is, um... Well, it has, it has two differences. One is that, um, it has several differences. Okay, so in computer vision, typically what you have is uh, object classification in which you identify an object and then you say, this is a person, this is a table, this is a whatever, a vehicle. And typically there, what they're after are categories, right? So, um, they want to categorize the world, but they're not really after language, right? So they will want to say person regardless of whether, you know, it's a girl. Let me say here, I have a nice slide. You know, person regardless of, 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 of whether it's a, it's a woman who's a performer or a skateboarder or a nun, 
or you know uh, a young woman that can also be described as a girl, right? Um, they're not in. I mean, the typ the typical computer vision people are not interested in that, right? Um, so there's a few resources that have names like Visual Genome, which is the one that we use for for uh, to extract mm -hmm. the, the the one that we extract the data from. The I see. From. Okay, so this is based on Visual Genome. Got it. Visual mm -hmm. Genome, yes. So we extract the data from Visual Genome, and then uh, the difference with that one is that uh, well, they don't really they didn't really elicit names. They elicit the technically region descriptions, but mm -hmm. uh, the, the main difference is that we're asking systematically asking for um, quite a lot of, of so quite a lot of different people to provide data for each image. So in Visual Genome, you know, uh, for a given region, you have, you know, one annotation, whereas here, what we have is, um, um, you know, over 30 annotations for each, for each image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the other parallel in computer vision that you have, you have uh, data sets that are annotated for referential expressions. So things like, for instance, the woman pouring wine or something like that. Yeah. And uh, well, the difference there is that we we only have names. We don't we we, we don't have the full referential ex referring expression. And this is just for expediency because we like collecting multiple referring expressions comes with much more uh, what with with some challenges also to analyze them and stuff. And we are actually now moving to referring expressions. But basically, our research focuses on on, on, on the names. And again, yeah. So this is a free naming task, right? Where people yes. would just, I see. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a free naming task. So what we choose them, and, and in fact, we had to, because you know, these computer vision people often what they want, what they want the 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 the, the, the users to do is not really you know to provide natural language. So for instance, with um, uh, there's uh, there's this other data set for uh, Flickr 30K where so typically they ask them to provide captions, for instance, that will be kind of very descriptive of the image as if somebody who's blind, you know, was watching the scene and you wanted to reproduce it. And then people, and they instruct people to use a lot of modifiers and things, right? So if you tell people to produce language like that, they will produce language like that, but it doesn't mean that it's a language that they would produ uh, produce without, without these instructions. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's very nice that all these resources exist, but for instance, refer it comes with a, with a ton of problems. So, yeah. That's Sorry for yeah, that's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Carlos has a comment uh, following up on, on your answer to his question, but it's also stated in Spanish on the April Link chat uh, webpage. Okay, let me, you would like to take a, take a look at that. Check. Uh, let me check. need to refresh the page, probably. Do you see the last um, message? So suddenly my suddenly oh, it, it's it not working. Wait, no, I'm not seeing it. Let um, me see if it can copy and paste that into the Zoom chat. Um, yeah. I, okay, now I see it. Sorry. You see it? Yeah. Okay, Carlos. Uh, for instance, a phoneme T could have allophones that are dental or alveolar, but not velar because they're very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this tells you, okay, so I guess, and now I understand. Thank you, Carlos, for the explanation. I think that, so what this shows you is uh, in a way that allophones, need to be similar enough, right? Similar enough to the, you know, to the other allophones, let's put it like that. Hmm. But what happens with the two related part of the Goldilocks uh, prediction, right? Because if they're too related, they're too similar, they will just be the same allophone, right? So here, because we don't have the distinction between form and meaning, right? Uh, that's what's giving us this, this, this playing ground. Uh, in the case of phonemes, we cannot have this tension, right? Because when, when, when allophones are too similar, they're just, they just converge to the same. 
Am I right or am I missing something? Maybe Carlos can respond briefly if you're still there. Yeah, yeah. But it's, um, but yeah, it's, it, it's a nice analogy, but it's, uh, it's only the cannot be two different um, aspect, um, but the cannot be two related, uh, we don't have. Yeah, I see here it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, okay, great. That's what Carlos said, great. Awesome. Um, I guess I'll, you know, I'll try to end this conversation with a more general question um, to you, Gemma. You know, I think you've been working on distributional semantic models and this particular work that you presented to us is more focused on sort of meetings in discrete space where you have these dictionary uh, sort of word, word list um, based kind of concepts and, and forms. And, and, and I just wonder, you know, what do you see as the right approach towards modeling meaning? Uh, is it a distribution approach versus this discrete approach where, you know, how, how might these different kinds of approaches sort of interact uh, with each other towards the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like even, so here we have a, a discrete list of, of meanings, which is a very impoverished view of, of, of meaning. It's just a, yeah, an expedient because, you know, Whatever the clicks people said was a meaning, we say, uh, we mm -hmm. take as a meaning, and there's like much more ruins to it, of course. Um, and if I may uh, just run a bit off track, um, sure. There's also like a lot of, you know, meanings do not come only in pairs, right? So in, in, in English, for instance, you have uh, grandfather and grandmother, but you also have grandparents, right? So in English, do these two meanings colexify or do they not? Because they both, they, they do colexify in grandparent, but they also have their, 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 their own words. So there's a lot of uh, complexity in, in the data that we are uh, glossing over, right? Um, okay, but going back to the, to the question, we, we have this discrete set of meanings, but we are modeling them in distributional terms. That right. is behind the lines, uh, there's the behind the lines. You say that behind the scenes. Sorry, uh, the scene. Um, we are taking them as a more complex thing. Namely, we are representing them as, as if the words they were words in a multi multi dimensional space, and then right. we can estimate distribution of similarity because you cannot really estimate the similarity of two symbols. If you have you know the, the standard approach to meaning, which would be you know just put things in all caps. Left in left in uppercase is uh, is the meaning of left. Then uh, this meaning is as similar to the meaning of right as it is um, as it is to the meaning of say table right or democracy. Uh, what the way we are treating meaning is in this more graded graded fashion that allows us to estimate similarity in a, in a graded fashion, and that's why I was saying that's one of the reasons I think that distributional semantics is promising for linguistic research and definitely mm -hmm. uh, this, this, view, this view of meaning as something highly multidimensional in which there's many, many different dimensions that play a role, cultural, uh, linguistic, um, you know, um, visual, et cetera. No? Uh, we, we have, there this very highly multidimensional thing that enters into very complex relationship with each other. And we need a powerful model and a model that can account for uh, first gradability, so gradedness in many, many aspects of meaning. Um, for not only, for instance, not only similarity of meanings, but also uh, when we look at semantic change, something that you have also looked, uh, looked at, uh, Yang, in your research, right? Mm -hmm. So sem the semantic change, for instance, uh, the word gay that used to, you know, mean and still means uh, merry and happy, you know, how, how gay moved to, to meaning homosexual, it didn't do it from one day to the next. It was a gradual process, right? And there were some dimensions there and others that were uh, highlighted and activated and suppressed and so on, right? And this is something that uh, theoretical linguists working on historical semantic change have long noted, know that it was a gradual process. How do you account for that in a system, in a symbolic system, right? That's why I'm a fan of, uh, of uh, not only distributional semantics, but uh, other data-driven approaches to language that allow for this kind of, of effects to emerge. And I am 
profoundly convinced that language is not symbolic. It has some symbolic aspects, you know, uh, something is a phoneme or, or, or not, right? So it's, 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 uh, it has uh, also some symbolic aspects, but meaning cannot be accounted for in purely symbolic terms. And yeah, I, I believe that not right. only distributional semantics, but, but also neural networks have, have a lot to say. The problem, if I may, sorry, you were going to say something. I'm no, no, no. Loving no. on. No, 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 please go ahead. No, the, 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 the problem with neural networks, because um, for those of you who, who have heard a bit of arti about the artificial intelligence, you may have heard about neural networks or deep learning, which is the, the big thing in AI and the thing that Google and Facebook and these people use uh, to process language. And I have been looking at those models. And <clears throat> because I, I want to understand how language works. So I'm a linguist. But the methods I've been using are data-driven and, and computational just because it gives me tools to, to examine data in a different way. I always say, I will make, make the analogy that uh, using computational methods is as if you, you, know, you were given a telescope. It allows you to see things that with a naked eye, you would, you would, you would not be able to, to see, all right? And it's complementary to other methods that maybe are more like a microscope, right? And and up to now, using computational models was helping me in discovering things about language that I like. And lately, when, when using neural networks, what happens is that I end up, because these are super complex models, I, and, and neural networks, the reason I'm mentioning them is that distributional semantics is very, very related to neural networks. In fact, distributional lexicons are a part of, 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 of most neural network models of language. But these models are so complex that in the end, what we end up doing, linguists working on computational linguistics with neural networks, is trying to understand how the model works rather than how language itself works, right? It's, it's, not, it's not useful anymore as a model of the phenomenon that we want to, 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 to understand in the sense of uh, helping us understand how it works. And that's why lately I've been, you know, uh, changing my, my, my route more to go more towards what I call data science for linguistics or quantitative linguistics in which, you know, you analyze, I still analyze a lot of data. I still use computational methods like distributional semantics because they're very useful, but uh, I don't do computational uh, modeling per se. Yeah, sorry, that was a long answer and I'm not no, sure. That's, <laughs> no, that, that, that is great. I mean, I, I, I share the intuition that, you know, using neural nets as a, as a tool or model for um, accounting for word meaning. But, you know, there's another line of research where people spend a lot of time probing these models, trying to understand what they do in the first place. So mm -hmm. great. I think uh, we're going to end right here. Gemma, on behalf of Aberling and everyone else, all the audience here, let me thank you again for joining us today. That was a wonderful talk. And uh, I'd like also to thank everyone who joined us today and hope that you will continue to watch uh, the Aberling lecture series. Uh, thanks, Gemma, and uh, see you next time. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.